Hello, everybody. Welcome to the last course of the semester. Oof. Today, I want to talk about three things. Yeah, maybe close the door. I want to finish the discussion of super peers. Last week, I explained that peers, nodes that you find have all kinds of heterogeneity. They're very different. And in fact, it's a very strong property, and it obeys something called the power law. Power laws are very interesting. I'm only going to say a little bit about it. It's connected to small world networks. Again, all real organic human natural systems are going to be obeying power laws. The web is also obeying power laws. Lots of things obey power laws. And if you want to learn more about power laws, again, I recommend this course, 1115. If you really want to understand all the weird stuff that goes on on the internet. So now I'm just giving a small introduction to that with peers. And then I'll talk about Skype, the original Skype. Uh, Skype was a proprietary system. Nobody knows what's inside Skype. It's a mystery. And especially since it was bought by Microsoft, the one I'm going to explain to you is the one that was before Microsoft. And it's really interesting because it's actually using super peer architecture. So the original Skype was invented using super peer. And then I'll talk about DHT. This is distributed hash table. This is the third generation of peer to peer. This is peer to peer where the nodes are not random but they are connected according to a very precise topology that makes it really nice, self-organizing, very interesting. So I'll give you an introduction to that. And then I'll talk about RAFT, which is a consensus algorithm that achieves uh, just less than n over 2 resilience. So it's just as powerful as maximum power you can get. But it's much simpler than the one that uh, was invented by Leslie Lamport called Paxos in 1989. Paxos is very complicated, and Raft is much more intuitive. And since around 2014, almost everybody, Google and Amazon, they're all using Raft now. They all threw away Paxos when, as soon as Raft was invented. So if you're going to use consensus, you're going to use something like this. And it's the most powerful consensus algorithm. And this one is very intuitive, so I'll explain that. Okay, Very good. Let me start by continuing. This is basically continuing the discussion of super peers. So the heterogeneity of peers, they're very different. Huh? Some very strong, some very weak. And you can study this, and it's actually really interesting, and it obeys very interesting laws that you can uh, graph. And nobody designed it like that. It just by that nature, it just is like that, OK? Power law relationships. So what are power laws? Power laws is very simple. Basically, the probability of something that the probability uh, that uh, some random variable is at least x is going to be proportional to x to some power, OK? So this is an x minus alpha. It's proportional to a power. And this number can be whatever, 1 or 2, minus 1, minus 2. And if you make a logarithm of this, this is a, in a kind of a power law. It's like a polynomial. But if you do the logarithm of the probability corresponding to the logarithm of x, OK, if you take the logarithm of that, it gives you the log of the probability is going to be log c minus alpha times log x. OK, so you see, in terms of log, log, it's a straight line, OK, with some slope, minus alpha, OK. So this is really weird, in fact. But this is, I mean, this is just a function. But this function, we find it many places. Here's one place where you find power laws. 
in, in natural, in, the, in human society. This is cities. Here you have cities, like cities, like Villeneuve, Brussels, Paris, Tokyo, whatever, right? big and small cities. All villages are, a village is considered a very small city. Look at the population here, 200,000, 400,000. So the more you get people, the fewer you have of the cities, okay? This is percentage of the cities. Notice that if you have very small population, you have more cities. So this gives you kind of a, a curve that really uh, descends very quickly, okay? So this does not tell you very much on the left. But if you take logarithm, if you make a log-log scale, then it turns out to be almost like a straight line. Now that's really weird. How do the cities know they have to be on the straight line? Nobody designed them to be on a straight line, but they are on a straight line. And this is a result of natural processes, how cities grow, how they live. Huh? A big city will attract more people. A small city will attract fewer people. So it's like a rich get richer phenomenon. A huge city like Mexico City or Paris will attract huge numbers of people. So it can grow a lot, whereas a small city will not. And it will not grow so much. And this gives you log log, uh, a, a new power log, straight line in a log log. Now, this is also related to small worlds. Uh, I'm not going to say so much, but I want to just say a little bit here. A power law, it's like this. The probability that it's at least little x is proportional to x to the minus alpha. Okay, so the more x increases, this decreases. Okay, the probability it goes bigger is smaller. And here you have some constant c. You choose it so, the, so that the probabilities, you take the integral, it has to be 1, of course. Huh? So this is just some normalization. Okay, so if you make a logarithm of this, you get a straight line. And, uh, okay, so a little bit of, of uh, explanation. This has the property of scale invariance. That means if you change the value, if you replace x by something, whatever, beta times x, and you change the scale, then it's still a power law. It's just that the constant changes. Huh? You have beta x minus alpha. So you just have a new constant, in fact. But it's still power law. This is called scale invariance. The law looks the same. It's still a straight line on log log. It's still, no matter what scale you look at on, big scale or large scale. This is only true of power law, okay? Because you need this kind of a relationship. If you solve that, it turns out into a power law. There is a, another law, a law which is called Zipf's law, which is related, which is a, an example of a power law. So the Zipf law is the frequency of an event related to its rank. So what does that mean? So for example, uh -huh. The typical example, so the ranking, and here you have the, the frequency of something. Typical one is words in a language, okay? So the most popular word is, is, has some frequency. Uh, in English it's something like, I don't know, the or something. Huh? But then if you rank the words according to popularity, it turns into a curve which is like 1 over f. And that's a power law, OK? Now, in real life, the exponent is not always minus 1. Huh? Here it's minus 1. But, but basically, it's also a power law. Uh -huh. The expected value of the rth ranked variable. Here we don't have the population. We have rank. We start by the most, the one that has the most, and you order them in decreasing power or, or value, okay? And that turns into a power law. So whenever you have frequency in terms of rank, giving this, this is called the, the Zipf's law, and the Zipf was a, a, 
a language, a guy who studied language, and he found that for natural languages, you get that. So the most popular words in a language, all the words in a language will be this. So a, a very rare word here uh, will be less popular than a very very popular word, but the but it's according to this law. It's weird, huh? Why is it a law like this? Okay. So this again is an example of a, a power law of a natural thing, a language, a natural language. Nobody designed the language to have that law. So why does it have that law? Well, it depends on what the language is used for. More popular words have less information, but they are needed to connect to the other ones. And apparently, that is something that happens at all scales. Okay. Here's another example. Parita was a famous econo econom economist who lived at the end of the 19th, beginning 20th century, Italian. Here, he made a question. How many people in northern Italy, that's what he had the data for, have an income greater than X? Okay, so P is now the percentage of people with their income so much lira per year or whatever that they earn. Okay, again, it's a power law. The probability that a person earns X or more. Probability is the percentage of people. Huh? If you pick a person randomly, again, it's a power law. And Perito, we'll see him in many, many places. You will also see him here. Uh, Perito, the principle of Perito on optimizing large uh, things, production or productivity of society. So this guy made a lot of um, contributions there. But here again, he discovered this power law. Okay, So you can see power laws are really uh, common in anything that comes from uh, nature or human society, anything that is kind of a large organization where you have many different sizes of things interacting. Okay. Now it turns out, now we get back to the peers, peers are also very similar. Here is uh, a, file, a file sharing system called Fast Track. This is from an article from 2004 which is mentioned here. These graphs are coming from there. Here is the rank of the IPs. So this is logarithmic. Huh? And every time you use an IP address, it's different. Huh? Because here you have a lot. Huh? You have, so this is like over several weeks or months of use. And this is the volume. Whenever there's a connection, you have a certain amount of volume in megabytes. Okay. It turns out this again, so this straight line would turn correspond to the the, the power law. Uh -huh. But it's not really a straight line here, it's almost a straight line. You can see it's kind of straight, then it curves and it goes straight again. So it has like two straight parts. So this is not exactly a power law. And you can see therefore that there's a huge difference, okay, in the most, the IP with the most traffic and the least traffic, here they're all pretty close, so they're doing file exchange, so they're not, the amount of data change is not diff, so much different, but still you have this very interesting, almost straight line relationship, okay, this one is not exactly a power law because it's not a straight line, but it's still almost a straight line, and there's a term for that. This is called a heavy, a heavy tailed distribution. So a heavy tailed distribution is basically any distribution where it's some kind of a polynomial, okay, and not exponential. You can find that on the on the Wikipedia if you want. So here we have basically two, some kind of a polynomial in the log log, not a straight line, but close to a straight line, okay? So this is related to power law. There's also a connection between all these ranks, the ranks. Somehow they all know they have to be on this funny curve. How do they know that, okay? And here's another one. 
This is the rack again. This is how long they're on, the on time for each, the length of each connection, basically. Yeah? So these also, they're almost the same, because now we're looking at the, the messages in a, in a file sharing system, okay? But still, uh, you can have, you have them where they're on less often. So again, it's, it's kind of a funny curve. It starts by being almost horizontal, but it dis descends, then it curves down, okay? So again, it's heavy tailed. This is for fast track. But here's BitTorrent. BitTorrent is uh, more interesting. Here we have the peers, and we have ranking, okay, like in the zip flow. And here we have the uptime, how many hours it's up. And it's a log log, huh? you can see here. The peer that's up the longest is here. This is peer number 10, peer number 100, and so on. And you, you make the distribution. This was downloading a file called Beyond Good and Evil in 2006, and they were 53,833 peers total, and this is how it distributes, okay? Notice that it starts by printing kind of horizontal. These, the small, these peers are all very strong than staying up, but then it goes down. Notice this is very close to a straight line, okay? And if you want to see the slope of this line, okay, it's basically very close to minus one, if you see. If you increase by 10, go to rank number 1,000, it goes down a factor of 10. This is very close to a straight line until you get to the really, really flaky, the highly ranked peers, then, it, then they basically don't do so well anymore. Huh? But for many orders of magnitude between 10 and, 10 and something like 5,000, okay? It's, so this is like three and a half orders of magnitude. It's a straight line. It's funny, huh? The very strong peers and the very weak peers, somehow they organize themselves in this straight line. So this is a typical kind of power law, okay? So here's another, uh, curve. Here we have the, the downstream bandwidth and the number of downloaders. Here we have again a kind of funny straight line. Funny straight line. There's two curves here. Right? Here you have the cumulative curve, but here you have the, the number of downloaders. Ten downloaders have this bandwidth, uh, and then uh, they go up like this. So there's many more here with a low downstream bandwidth, and they kind of spread out when you get to the lower numbers, but here you see again like almost a kind of straight line, okay? So this is from the same article as before. So again, you get this funny straight line. Why is it like that? If you want to know why it's like that, you have to make a model of how peers organize themselves. If you want to see that, that's something that we discuss in this course, but it's basically, uh, if you want to know why, why you have this really nice curve from just a bunch of peers, you have to find a model of how they organize themselves, okay? And let me just give one or two ideas on this. Typical model, the typical model, there's self-organization. Right? There's, no, there's no central guy giving the orders. Each peer is just doing its own thing. Okay, they're self-organizing. The typical model is called rich get richer model. It's also called preferential attachment. Basically what it means is that uh, a peer, a strong peer will have a tendency to get stronger. Or a popular web page, because web pages, popular web pages are also organized according to power law. The more popular a web page is, the more it will get popular, okay? The more famous a celebrity is, the more you see that, that weird person on TV uh, or whatever, the more famous they get. Uh, and that works at all scales. And it's like rich get richer. If you're rich, it's easy to get richer. 
And if you're very rich, it's easy to get a lot richer. So rich get richer phenomena. This gives you kind of a positive feedback effect. And this turns into power loss. Uh, big cities have a lot of power compared to small cities, and they will get bigger compared to the small city, where they will have more economics or whatever. Huh? So they will, and they will absorb the small cities that are around them. So this gives the, a model. So that's kind of why it's like that. Okay. And now, okay, this is used in the super peer. This is used for promotion, peer promotion. You find the, the strong peers and you update them, okay? You find which peers are the strong according to these curves. You make a local decision, but you have some kind of a, a measurement, a model, and so basically the system is kind of drawing this curve. How do you know if the peer is a powerful peer? You have to compare it to other peers. So you need to do some kind of a gossip comparing it to other peers and see whether it's a powerful peer or not, okay? And then you make the decision of whether it becomes a super peer, okay? So typically it's uh, using gossip, okay? And using gradient topology, which we saw last time, okay? You will have some kind of a gossiping algorithm running over random neighbors and kind of calculating the power. It's basically drawing the curve, okay? Yeah? And it can find the top percent. Because if you are one megabit bandwidth peer, you don't know whether you're powerful or not. That huh? depends on how you compare it to the other ones. Uh, Ten years ago, you were maybe powerful, but not today with that kind of performance. Huh? So you would say, if you're in the top 5%, okay, or the top 1%, to find that out, you need gossip algorithms, okay? Okay, so uh, there were some other... No, this is... Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about uh, power loss. That gives you some, some idea that this is an important concept. So you're going to see this in many places. So this concept comes back and it's used here, but in many other places, okay? Let me now finish the super peer by talking about Skype. Everybody knows Skype. Skype is a European invention. It was invented in Sweden, uh, eventually bought by Microsoft, but now in those days, when these slides were coming from the early days, when Skype was extremely popular and still an independent company, this is called Voice over IP telephony system. Um, it's based on super peer and it's proprietary. So nobody really knows except for the people working in Skype how it works. So what I'm going to tell you here comes from an article that did some kind of reverse reverse engineering. Okay. Some but some people decided to dig in and try to figure out. So I'll explain a little bit of how the Skype works. The first point is logging in. How do you connect? You cannot, you contact, you have to know some, some entry points. These are called bootstrap servers. Oh, okay. And once you connect the bootstrap servers, you find out, you know you learn some, some super peers. Okay, so Skype is using a super peer architecture, or in those days, it had a small number of super peers, and it was always changing, yeah? a very powerful node would get promoted and would become super peer because, because the Skype company did not own all that, all those computers, okay? They were basically parasites running off of the people who were using them. So the super peers were, were determined on the fly when it was running. So it started by contacting a bootstrap server. So you need to know some bootstrap servers. So these are known, these are published, okay? So when you log into Skype, so this is Skype, this is you, you log in to some bootstrap server, okay, and then it connects you to some, and something more inside, which is the login server, and it tells you who are some super peers, 
Okay. Now, if you are a very strong node, you can actually get promoted to become a super peer. Now, that's not really a, uh, you don't earn extra money. In fact, the system will, will use the, your power uh, to, to help other people if you become a super peer. Okay. So Skype has some algorithm. Okay. And the way it works, okay, is actually where it was very simple in those days. It didn't do so much. Uh, it used this, there's a protocol called STUN, which used to stand for Simple Traversal of UDP Through NATs, which maybe you know something about. You know something about this? Well, I'm not going to explain it more. But the idea was if you have an open IP address, I mean, you're not behind a network address translator. You don't have, you're not protected. You're open IP, then you're a good guy, okay? You have an open IP, so here's the if. And if you have a good bandwidth, it's bigger than some min minimum, you would get promoted to super peer. So in those days, it was very easy, okay? So you could become a super peer very quickly, okay? In, in those days, in Skype when you log into Skype, okay? Okay, now the question, once you're in, yeah? Question? Why does the node would like to be a super peer? The node, it's not, why would the node, well the node is not the one deciding. Uh, the node wants to use Skype, and the node runs the Skype software. So the node wants to run Skype. Now if the Skype software internally decides that it's going to use you as a super peer, you have, you have no, the only thing you can do is quit Skype, okay? You can tweet your computer to have a low connection? You, if you can artificially give yourself low bandwidth if you don't want to become super peer. Huh? This is, yeah, this is not, this is kind of, a selfish node would not want to do this. It's what you're saying, right? Completely true, but Skype, it only works if you have a small percentage of these strong nodes, otherwise it doesn't work. And in those days, people didn't really care. You connect to the net, and if you used a lot of your bandwidth, fine. I mean, people didn't really care. So some nodes were super peers. So they were paying maybe more. And sometimes people, yeah, sometimes people did care if they, if they're, uh, uh, how do you say, if they started paying more every month or something, because they were using Skype a lot, then they became unhappy, okay? And so Skype, in the beginning they did like this and it worked, but afterwards they maybe had to change this, 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 when people started realizing that Skype was a little bit taking advantage of them. Huh? But this was the good old days when the internet was still open and free, and people were building things on top of the open internet, okay? Unfortunately, those days are gone now. Skype had a directory a kind of big database, and they called it Global Index, like a phone book. Huh? Uh, basically, you have your Skype ID, and it, once with that Skype ID, you can look it up how to connect to that person. And what is it? Well, this is the only thing Skype, the company, said about this. It's a multi-tiered network where supernodes communicate in such a way that every node in the network has full knowledge of all available users and resources with minimal latency. So it's doing some kind of routing between super nodes, but nobody knows, okay, this is internal to Skype. So there's some kind of a, a database or directory inside uh, the, the Skype super peer network. So here we have the Skype super peer network, okay. Here you have some of these super peers are actually the database. Probably these are not the users that are promoted. Huh? Maybe this is a small number of very strong ones that are actually paid by the Skype company or something. Huh? Because these are very important when you want to look up. When I have an ordinary peer here that wants to get the address of another ordinary peer, so this ordinary peer knows a super peer, and it asks the address, the super peer will make a request to the global index, and the global index will tell me how to get to OP2. And OP2 will be registered with the global index. Okay? So this, so you have a system actually with three levels, huh? 
You have the ordinary peers, the super peers, which are handling connectivity. And then you have the global index, which is like the, a directory. Or remember, Napster had a central directory. Well, this is kind of like a decentralized directory. Yeah? It's not one node. It's a set of nodes, but they're like a database. They're like a big phone book. And this is how the original Skype worked. Okay. How is the global index working, or how did it work? Nowadays, probably it's all just stored in Microsoft Cloud, huh? but not in those days. What is it? This was all speculation. Nobody actually knew except for people working at Skype. Huh? They didn't publish anything on it. Could it be uh, a DHT? So I'll talk about DHT in a little while, a distributed hash table. Could it be something like DNS? Or could it actually be centralized, some huge system that is like centralized with huge bandwidth? Nobody knows. Nobody. Well, people who work for Skype, they know. They're not saying. Okay. Okay. Skype also has some tricks for NATs. NATs are a pain. So this is network address translation. This gives you a different IP address space inside the company and outside the company. So the NATs kind of at the boundary. But not all nodes have that. So how do they accept connections if they're behind a NAT gateway? Okay. And the way it's usually done is they, it tries to have an always open TCP connection to a super peer. So everything goes through the super peers. Okay. That uh, lets it communicate. Okay. And I just, let me just say a few things about that. That was a big thing in those days too. Uh, how do you handle nodes that are behind NATs? So you have maybe seen that in other courses. How do you do nut hole punching? Have you seen that? Remember, no? Oh, you should have seen maybe seen that in courses from uh, Olivier Bonaventure. But uh, basically, it's a big problem because you have it, it basically protects the internal uh, IP addresses from the outside ones, and only certain kinds of connections are allowed. Okay? So there's a whole a range of NATs, and you can look it up on the uh, internet. And Skype used two techniques, which is, one of them is called STUN, and the other one is called TURN. STUN, so these are acronyms, used to be called Simple Traversal of UDP through NATs, but they, they changed the acronym because this thing has evolved. If you look at Wikipedia now, it's called Session Traversal Utilities for NAT, but they keep the same acronym. And TURN is Traversal Using Relay NAT. So Relay means it actually has to do, uh, it goes to a third node, okay? And Skype used both STUN and TURN. And it starts by using STUN, and if STUN fails, then it does relay. So let me, sh I'll show you in the next slide how it works a little bit. And it turns out that in those days, about 9%, uh, one out of every 11 uh, Skype connections was relayed. Relayed means that it was not a direct connection, it was going through a third party. So let me explain that. I'll explain stun and then I'll explain relay, so the term. Stun works a little bit like this. I'm not going to go through all of the details. So here you have an ordinary peer sitting behind this brick wall, which is the net. Uh, so here you have the external internet. Here you have the internal internet of the company. Here you have another ordinary peer with its own brick wall. And they want to talk to each other. But they're not allowed, they're, it's not possible for this one to make a direct TCP connection to this one. But they might be able to do it if the connection comes from outside. So somehow, this ordinary peer has a, a connection to a, a stun server. So there's some servers, and have, you need to have that. So it gets the address of the second peer. Okay, this is point number one here. And then the stun server tries to connect to the second one. And connections from outside usually are much easier than a connection that starts from inside. Okay, and both these two then 
try to uh, using the information given by this try to connect to each other so maybe OP1 cannot connect to OP2 but OP2 can connect to OP1 because these nets are not the same okay so once they have a direct connection they can they can do bidirectional so this this violet blue violet line okay and so the NATs have only a certain uh, possibility. Some NATs are easy to connect from outside. Some NATs you can connect from inside, but only to certain nodes and so on. So the stun tries to find a way coming from both sides. Okay. But it does not always work. And when it doesn't work, Skype will use relay. So this is the turn thing. These are super peers. And it's easy for an internal node to connect to a node which is on the open internet. So this is a super peer. So you have a connection here. And this node will make a connection to the second peer, the destination. So then all the communication will be relayed. Okay, there will be no direct communication. So you see it's kind of a hack. Huh? You go through the relay server and then you go back. But because the super peer is very strong, the bandwidth is very high, maybe it's okay. Uh, so this is the second way. So Skype was not just super peer, it had to do a lot of work to get around this NAT thing. Huh? So if you're doing uh, internet applications, you will have to worry about NATs too. Huh? Okay, so this is just a little bit to explain. Uh, Skype. And it worked. In those days it worked. Nowadays it's not going to work so so easily, okay? Nowadays it's there are other approaches based on content delivery or data centers, okay? But in those days, when I say those days, I mean 10 years ago or 15 years ago, huh? this worked. And there is low churn among the super peers. So remember churn? Churn is when you have a large dynamic system that uh, with a certain number of nodes is that the identities of the nodes are always changing. So nodes are always leaving and arriving. So every hour maybe you have 1% of the nodes who are leaving and 1% is arriving. And so you have this measure called churn. The super peers, we're assuming they have low churn. They have median session time, several hours. And it's heavy tailed. That means that there's a lot of uh, a lot of them with very long session times. Huh? One of the things about heavy tail and power law is that there are a lot of these big super peers. Huh? There are a lot of big cities. There are a lot of very popular websites, much more than if it were exponential. Exponential e to the minus x goes down very fast. Huh? If, I, if I have something like this, huh? this number, this function goes down very fast to zero when x increases, whereas this one does not. This is a, a, a power, okay? This is why it's heavy tailed. It's much higher value than the exponential. So they're heavy tailed means there are a lot of these guys. Okay? There are a lot of very powerful peers, a lot of very powerful, very popular web pages. Um, a lot of rich people, people who earn a lot of money, and so on. Okay. Here's some measurements that were done. Here is the online time. The red ones are the super peers, and the blue ones are the regular peers. This is the fraction of time that they're online, and this is the time of day. Um, UTC, UTC, which is Greenwich time, so London from midnight to midnight. And it's only one hour difference from where we are. So you see at noon there's a lot. Midnight there's less, okay. It's usually normal. You can see, well, in Asia, in Asia, uh, that would be different. And you can see there's several bumps here. Okay, so this noon here is noon here, whereas this little bump will probably be something like noon in Asia. Huh? 
Whereas this bump here would be noon in New York or something like that. Huh? So these, this is kind of a worldwide thing. So you can see the, the super peers are much more online. And the session times, you can see that uh, how many have session times greater than x? So 1%, the probability that the session time is bigger than uh, 8 days, OK, is 1%. The probability, so there's 1% of the peers who are basically always on, okay? It's probability is bigger than 10% of the peers will be on for like one and a half days, okay? So this is a cumulative distribution function again, but in log-log plot. Huh? So you can see there's a lot of guys still this is not a straight line, but it's not that different. Eh? So this is a heavy-tailed distribution again. Okay. So this gives you so Skype works because peers are distributed according to power laws. Otherwise, it would not even have worked. Okay. That's important to understand. When they invented Skype, the people who invented Skype, they had no idea it was going to work. That it would scale to hundreds of thousands of users. It would only work if they could find enough super peers. How do they know that there are so many super peers? Well, well, maybe they did know according. Maybe they did their homework and they did the statistics. But there are a lot of super peers, enough to make it work. Okay. If it would have been different, if the number of super peers would have been exponential, it would not have worked. Okay. So this structure, the Skype works because of some natural structure, okay? Okay, fine, that's it. Skype was a very influential system, okay? In those days, when I started using Skype, which was like 15 years ago, uh, you guys were still in primary school maybe, I don't know. I was already working here using Skype. This was a, this was a big thing, okay? Skype was a big thing. And uh, it had a huge impact. And nowadays, it's very common. Uh, Zoom, uh, Jitsi, whatever, all these video conferencing. In those days, it was really, really uh, state of the art, uh, really special. OK, that's all I'm going to say about super peers and Skype. Let me now talk about. DHTs, okay? We already saw a little bit of this, but let me just go one step farther now, because you have to know what are DHTs, okay? You cannot leave this course without knowing what is DHT. So I have to tell you what is DHT. So this we saw before. Remember the first, second, and third generation? So this is the third generation, okay? You have some distributed hash table. Remember I showed you this box? You have all the computers inside organized together, and you have queries coming in and out. So this is a hash table, and they're not random. Well, now I'm going to explain how it works. This was also a big thing when it was invented. Okay? Let me show you the first one. So there's many, many systems are doing this. Uh, the first system is called Cord, the guys who invented it in 2001. But then many, many systems come after. And nowadays, so many, and they don't even say, like, databases even do it inside of clouds. If you want to organize a database with 50 nodes, you organize them as a DHT. Okay. So here's how it works conceptually. You give numbers or names to files, for example, these are like files, and you give names to computers. Because the whole point is, where do you store the information? Okay, so you have some big namespace, like 64-bit vectors, and each computer gets a name, and each file gets a name. And you store the files, which are these little boxes, in the computer that is the closest by. 
So this gives you some kind of a distributed storage. Huh? I have three nodes here, and these three files are stored here, these two are stored here, these four are stored here. And how do we know that? Because of these identifiers. Oh, these three have identifiers that are closest to this one. Okay. So that's how you decide how to store it. And then somehow you connect them. You connect them, which I'll explain. You connect them so you can do routing. Okay. Okay, so that also that seems a little bit abstract, but let me show you now the real system, how it works. Yeah? Distributed hash tables. So here's a hash table. You know what a hash table is. You have keys, you have values, you have some hash function. So the, the, where it's stored, it's a function of the value. Huh? You take this hash table, you can store it on one computer, but you store it over many computing nodes. So it can be huge, huh? If you have a thousand nodes, you can put a huge amount of data there. Okay? So the basic service that you get is called lookup. That means you can access the value if you know the key from any node. And if I want to look up uh, key 11, okay, which is stored at node B, and I'm here at node D, and I do lookup 11, it's going to route. So each node has a routing table, okay? And it's a very smart routing table because when new nodes come into the system or they leave, the routing tables are updated automatically, okay? So the whole thing is completely resilient. So that's kind of the idea. So let's say I'm at node D and I do lookup 9. Oops. Then 9 is actually stored in node A. So we'll have to route to there, okay? And these routing tables are small. They will be logarithmic or constant. So there's small routing tables on each node. So you have these nodes, each one has a routing table, and the data is spread out over the nodes. Okay, you get the intuition, huh? And CORD actually defines a particular algorithm. CORD was the first system that did this in 2001. They invented this idea, okay? And afterwards, people jumped on it and started making huge amount of variations and stuff. And the way chord works, here is the identifier space. In this example, it's only four bits. That huh? goes from 0 to 15. But usually, it's much bigger, huh? 2 to the 128. Usually, you have huge bit vectors. But in this example, there's four bits, OK? And each little circle, is there's a computer there with that ID. So here I have computer number one, number three, number four, six, seven, nine, ten, and fifteen. So the number of computers, of course, is much, much less than the number of IDs. Okay? If you look at the sparse one, so this kind of gives you the wrong idea. If you look at the sparse one, it's more like this. Let me make a picture. Okay, so a real one, we have 128 bit keys, you have a bunch of nodes that are sitting around this circle. There can be any number here. And each of them has stores some data. There's some data here, some data here. Each one is storing some data. Each one has its own routing table. Huh? So these are numbers, I, A, I, B, huh? I, F, I, G, I, H. And all the other parts are empty. So the, in the real one, it's very, very, very sparse. Huh? Here it looks kind of full, but it's not going to be full. So the way to store data, each of these boxes is like a file, okay? It's storing a file you're storing, and it has also an ID. And you, an item, which is a box, is assigned to the first node that follows it on the circle. So this box, which has ID 2, will be stored on the first node in the circle that is there. So it will be stored on node 3. Uh, 8 and 9 will be both be stored on 9. 12 and 13 will both be stored at node 15. Okay. 
So that's how you decide where to store. And now the really clever thing is that each node has a routing table. Okay? Each node has routing pointers. And they're like exponential hops. Node has a pointer going 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, and so on. Huh? Every node knows successor and node n knows successor n plus 2 to the i minus 1. So it's like exponentially increasing. Okay. And the number of route of entries is log base 2 over the total number of uh, nodes in the system. Okay. Or you can, you can even allocate a number which is based on the, the size of the key. Huh? If I have a 128 bit key, I only need 128 routing entries, which is not so much. Okay? And now I can do routing. If I'm at node 1 and I want to get data number 15, I have to route. And the way it works is it will hop to the farthest node that is less than 15. You see that? So this one, it can go to, it could go to 3. Uh, the, there's no node at 2, so this, the 2 pointer will actually point also to 3. Uh, there's no node at 5, so the one that goes 4 hops will actually point to the 6, uh, which is the first one that's really there. And the 8 node will point to node 9. So you're going to go to the farthest node that's still less than where you're going. Of course, that's going to be the, this one, huh? the 9. So you're going to make one hop to 9 here. See, so the routing is very easy. You can do it with just a local calculation. You don't have to keep any global information. Okay. And then the next step, now I'm here. I still want to get to 15. Huh? I have 1, 2, 4, 8. So 8 is too far. One, two, four. So the four node is actually going to be pointing to 14, eh? because there's no node at 13. And it's still less than 15, so I go there. Okay? So I'm going to go there. Okay? Now I'm almost there. Okay? Now, now I see that my, my routing entry is actually going to be the value of the thing I'm looking for. So all I have to do is go just after that then. So basically I go, I hop to node zero, and then I'm, I have it, okay? So I have three hops in this case. Three hops. Uh, from one to nine to 14 to zero. And that gets me data item 15, and once I have it, I can transfer it back or whatever. Huh? So the routing is logarithmic. That's one thing. It's very efficient. The number of hops is low. The second thing is that the routing is done local computations. You don't need to have any kind of global coordination. And if you have failures, the, node, the routing tables will repair. I'm not going to explain it, but it's an important part. If node 9 fails, for example, then 1 cannot talk to 9 anymore. But eventually, it will then there's a repair protocol which it will find 10. Okay? Or if a new node comes in, like a node number 8 or something, that node will take part of the data. It will talk to its neighbors. And part of the data will be offloaded and come here. And the routing tables will slowly repair themselves then. Okay? So this whole thing is always changing. There could be 1,000 nodes on this circle, huh? And if nodes are coming in, they will be doing kind of local reparation. Notice it's never global. Question? Uh, when 8 is coming up, yeah. and so the information is going slowly to the network, yeah. then we will send to 9 because we don't know it yet. And Yes. So as long, uh, uh, yes. So, but but when the data is being transferred from nine to eight, then if you send a message to nine, maybe the data is not there anymore. Is what you're saying? Or yeah, there's actually a protocol for that. Of course, huh? you have to manage that. There's kind of a distributed locking kind of protocol between eight and nine. Huh? So the nine knows eight. Huh? 
and the nine, they, they know each other, and so the nine might say, you have to talk to eight. So the nine, so this has actually been implemented, of course, huh? The nine will then send a message back to one, saying, don't send to me, send to eight. So the, do you have some repair? But it's not actually so complicated. You just have to, because it's like converging, huh? It's allowed to make mistakes, but every time there's a mistake, the node knows it's a mistake. And it will tell the guy, fix the mistake. So the mistakes are always being fixed, in fact. Like, they're always like on the fly, converging. It's very robust, huh? It doesn't matter if there's some mistakes. The worst case, the mistakes, is they will increase the routing time. Okay? Is that sort of... Yeah, so, so yeah, so all of that is, is important, huh? And it's sometimes a little bit tricky, but it's not that complicated, actually. Huh? And in the slides, there's actually a, a system called DKS, which was implemented by people I'm working with in Sweden, which FIT does all that. So if you're really curious, if you look later on in these slides, you will see the, I mean, just if you're, if you're wondering, how can it work, okay? So DKS solves that, and CORD also. But DKS is a later thing, it's a little bit more efficient. But CORD invented it, huh? They invented the idea, the system called CORD. This DHT idea is really nice and powerful, huh? Because there's no central node at all. It's completely decentralized, and the routing tables are very easy to maintain, and they're small, okay? And it's extremely robust. You can add, you can add redundancy, huh? So in the real, uh, the real ones, the data is stored in more than one place, okay? So DKS, you can actually have some redundancy. You can have the data stored in three or four places. So if a node crashes, the data will not disappear. Huh? You have some redundancy. Uh, and so you get something very resilient. Huh? Okay. So that gives us different kinds of peer-to-peer -peer systems. Uh, you have the unstructured systems, and then the structured ones. So the DHT, like CORD, and there's many. Uh, here's three, CAN, Tapestry, Pastry, there's many more. Look on Wikipedia, you find so many of them now. These are called structured peer-to-peer, -peer, okay? Because they have a well-defined structure, topology. Whereas these other ones are using random neighbors. They are also still used, huh? These decentralized ones are actually still used. BitTorrent style is still being used today, yeah? So both of these are still being used, okay? Okay, that's all I'm going to see in this, for this part, okay? Now we make a break, and after the break I'll talk about consensus. Now, as the final thing in the course, I will talk about consensus again, because this is a very important algorithm. It's used a lot in different kinds of cloud tools, orchestration tools, and so on. And uh, we saw a consensus algorithm, which was complicated, but it only did N over 3 failures. But the most powerful consensus algorithm is called Texas. And it can handle the theoretical maximum. And, but it's very complicated because, and I didn't show it in this course, because it would be at least one or two lectures uh, that I would have to present. It's a very complicated algorithm. And it's hard to understand all the different the details of it. And it's now since 1989. So Raft is, has the same power as has uh, Paxos, but it is uh, much easier to understand. It's a reformulation. This was done in 2014, and in fact, since then, everybody is doing Raft. So Raft is like really used a lot. Okay. So this is the talk given by the guys who invented Raft, who is Diego Ongaro and John Osterhout. And they give, some, they give a lot of intuition, and I'll give them also some scenarios. In distributed systems, you can choose between availability or consistency. So what does that mean? Either uh, availability uh, means that you get an answer. But maybe there's not enough nodes connected, but the data is still consistent. 
Okay. Okay. This is how this is how people make distributed systems in real life. Okay, so this is like dirty secrets. Here we have a system with a single point of failure. This is how people sometimes still do it. They invent some weird hack. This case is rare and typically occurs as a result of a network partition with replication lag. Well, if that, if you see a sentence like that, that means you're using the wrong algorithm, okay? Uh -huh. This is ad hoc buggy. Not good, uh, not recommended. Real systems use consensus, Paxos or Raft nowadays, and there's consensus servers, like, so there's this thing called Zookeeper, and there's other services, and they are internally using consensus algorithm, so they don't have these weird problems. They're always consistent, okay? You know what consensus is. We actually saw the formal definition. Basically, agreement on shared state. You have a single system image, which means everybody agrees on things. You recover from failures. The idea is that as long as the failures is are in minority, then there's no problem. And this is what we saw. If the failures is less than n over 2, it's OK. But if a majority fail, then you lose availability, okay? Then, but the data is still consistent. The data that's stored there is still consistent, but you cannot do things, you cannot run things anymore, okay? So that's consensus according to Diego Ongaro and Osterhout in this talk. Why do you need consensus? Well, consistent storage systems, and I'll show a, a as the, one of the slides shows, almost all distributed applications running big scale, they need some kind of consensus, okay? System configuration. Let's say you have SQL database, multiple copies. One of them is the master. The others are following the master. Which one is the master? Well, you have to agree on that. Huh? If they would not agree on which one is the master, that's not good, huh? What shards exist? So how is the data organized? The different pieces of the data, the shards. Which servers show shard X? If they don't agree on that, well, your system is not going to be very consistent, okay? So for consistent replication, you usually will use some kind of consensus, okay? So that's just why you need consensus, a view of Ongaro and Osterhout. And this now is an important slide because it shows a general way of building a large distributed application. Okay? And they all, the big distributed applications, replicated servers, it all looks like this. They all have this structure. So here you have clients, million clients. The servers, here you have Amazon. Okay? This is Amazon. I saw three machines here, but they could be 10 or 20 or whatever. Huh? So how does this work? The state machine is the code of the application that's running. Okay? You have the x, y, and z are local variables, and you have code. The code is basically changing state. So when I say state machine, state machine, state machine, that's the code of the application, which is replicated three times. So this is actually called a replicated state machine. Huh? All the servers execute the same commands in the same order. Okay, and but of course because of delays and so on and maybe failures, they don't always agree exactly. So every server also has a consensus algorithm. So there's a consensus algorithm, the three circles here, running on all three. Okay, and that is connected to a log. So this is the stable storage. Okay. So this is the code running in the, in the RAM. The log is the disk, okay, the stable storage on the disk. So if a node crashes and reboots, it's fine. And the consensus makes sure that all of these are agreeing with each other. Okay? In fact, the agreement is only on what's stored in the log. Okay? Because that's the real, the real truth, uh, the real data 
the solid data that's important is what's in the log, okay? Because you can always crash and reboot and the log will always be consistent, okay? So the consensus ensures log replication. And the system will run, it makes progress, as long as a majority of servers are up, as what we saw before, right? in the consensus. So all very large distributed applications today are going to look, are going to be some variation of this structure. You see, that's nice, huh? This is a nice slide, huh? You can see how big distributed applications are done. Uh, so you have database, you have code running, and you have consensus. Okay. The failure model here is fail stop, so you know what it means. Huh? Not Byzantine, no? So where this is running inside a data center, and the data center is owned by one company, uh, and you don't have spies in there, usually, so we're not assuming there's any problem in terms of uh, enemies. Huh? We're running in a trusted, secure environment. The only thing that can happen is that the computers crash. So fail stop is the only Thing. And usually we know it crash. it's crashing, but not always, huh? Fail stop, usually we can have sometimes perfect failure detector here, but not always. It depends on how the data center, how, how it's organized. If you have many, many, if I have a small number, like in a cluster, I can know, and the failure detector is perfect. If I have a large number, like a hundred of these, then the failure detector is going to be eventually perfect, okay? This is how the whole application runs. And so the consensus algorithm is part of this, okay? Is that reasonable? What do you think? No que questions on that. Many large distributed applications are going to have this structure, okay? So it's good for me to show this now. This kind of brings together some, some things we saw in the course, huh? Okay, so now we focus on consensus. The first very powerful consensus algorithm is called Paxos invented by Leslie Lamport in 1989. The guy is absolutely brilliant. This guy he invented many things, so Paxos is one of them. The problem is this algorithm is complicated. And if you look at what people say, the dirty little secret of the NSDI, NSDI is, the, is, the, is all these experts building these systems. Huh? Uh, most five people really truly understand every part of Paxos. Oops. This is an anonymous reviewer. Nobody knows who said that. Or if you have this thing called Chubby, which is uh, uh, software done by Google. Well, they didn't say, but you can find this one sentence in there. There are significant gaps between the description of the Paxos algorithm and the needs of a real world system. Mm -hmm. The final system will be based on an unproven protocol. It means somehow they weren't able to implement the real full Paxos, so they made some simplifications or whatever, uh, which they were not able to prove, but yeah, it seems to work, right? This is, this is real software made by Google. Huh? So this is before Raft. Huh? So Paxos was important because people need to do consensus. Either they hack, they do ad hoc, or they try to do Paxos. Okay. So, this is when the Raft guys came in. They wanted a consensus algorithm. Correct, complete, and performance, like Paxos. Also understandable, which is not true for Paxos. What would be easier to understand or explain? Their algorithm is doing the same things, kind of, as Paxos, but in a different way. A different decomposition is what they say. So it has the same power. Uh, it goes up to n over 2, but it's much easier to understand, as you will see. Uh, and they actually did some tests. They did a user study, which I'll explain here. They used it in a course. This is interesting, huh? They taught Raft and Paxos in the course. And this is the grade you got for the Paxos on the exam, and this is the grade you got for Raft. And there was two kinds of people. The ones that first they shot Raft and then Paxos, the red crosses. And the ones first they tried to understand Paxos and then they went into Raft, which is the little blue, the blue X's. And you can see, if you compare it, so it's not completely significant, huh, that somehow, 
okay? The, the grades, so the, the raft grade, so the, 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 there's a lot of blue in the lower part of the graph, okay? Which means low grades. And there's much more red in the higher part of the graph, which means better grades, okay? You can sort of see. So they say, look, raft is easier to understand. This is the proof, okay? Sort of a proof, okay? And then they made a survey about the implementation. Which one is easier to implement? The red is Paxos easier, and the blue is Raft easier. So you can see the blue is much higher, okay? Or explaining Raft. So they say, look, Raft is great, you know? Look, we have proof. But I have to explain Raft now. Okay. Now you'll tell, you'll tell me whether you agree with these guys, huh? whether you can understand. Okay? Raft, the basic idea is it's doing linear collection. One of the nodes is the boss. Okay? We saw leader collection, right? It'll do something like that. One of the servers will be the leader. Okay? If there's a crash, if the leader crashes, another leader is chosen. Okay? And the leader is the one that is doing really the lead, taking the lead. The leader will take commands, appends them to log, and will send messages to the others. So the others are basically following the leader. Okay? And the leader will make sure things are stored on the log. That's the idea. And the safety means that uh, you don't have, you don't ever break the log, okay? The log is super important. You only elect leaders with committed entries in their logs, but you'll see how it works. So that's the basic idea. So all nodes, so you have the server. So all the nodes are either followers, candidates, or leaders. So when the whole thing is running, you have one leader and all the others are followers, okay? If the leader crashes, then you have to elect the new leader and you have a candidate. So when the system starts up, all the nodes are followers. And a node will be follower and says, oh, I need a leader. So eventually, after some random time, he times out and he becomes a candidate for election and he asks for votes and if he gets votes for majority then he becomes the leader but the other guys who did not get the votes will become followers again okay so the one that receives votes for majority will become the leader and of course only one can have votes for majority yeah that's sort of the idea and so execution looks like this. So the time is like this. So the normal execution is like this. So you have blue parts and the green parts. In the blue parts, you're electing leader. Uh, you do this leader election. One of them has to be elected. And once you start the green, then one of them is the leader, and it's like normal. Okay. So you have two kinds of operation. Election, when you try to elect a new leader. And the normal operation, when you have a leader and when everything's running normally. Here, for example, I, have, I elect a leader, and this green one is the leader is running and everything is normal. At the end, the leader crashes, so you elect a new leader. Here, the, it's all running normally, the leader crashes. In term three, the election doesn't work. There's like a stalemate, so they time out and they do another election. Eventually, you get an election works, and again, you have a leader, and so on. So it's always alternating, but usually, the leader will stay up for a long time. Huh? Usually, the election time should be very small. Okay. So you have terms. These are called terms. Whenever you have a new leader, it's a new term. Okay. And when the term starts, all the non-committed stuff that was not actually committed in the log is thrown away. So when a term starts, all the previous information that is not committed is obsolete, is thrown away. Because you really have are looking at the logs. Okay? So that's how it works. Okay. So a leader to maintain his authority, he's the boss, sends heartbeats. He says, I'm alive, as long as I'm alive, you obey me. And the, the followers say, yes, 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 yes. 
They received our piece, they say Mussolini is still there, he's still with <laughs> us, okay? Uh, but maybe I don't receive the time out anymore. I say, hmm, maybe Stalin is dead now, okay? I don't know if you saw the movie, Death of Stalin, it's very funny. Ooh. So they time out, so they're all looking at each other, the followers, and at some random time, the follower says, I'm a candidate for a new leader. So a new election is started, okay? And every node waits a random time before making candidate. And the randomness is helping the algorithm, as you'll see. Huh? So the first one that makes the candidate, all the other ones are going to vote for him, and he becomes a new leader. But if two of them are candidates very uh, almost the same time, maybe they will both get like half of the votes, and it's like stalemate, uh, and then they will do have to do another election, okay? So when the node becomes a candidate, it sends request vote to all the other servers, and it waits. And the best possibility, it receives votes from a majority, it becomes the leader, it sends heartbeats to all the other servers and says, now I'm the boss. They all say, yes, yes. And so then that's the normal situation, okay? If I am a candidate, and I'm waiting, but I receive a heartbeat from a valid leader, I will immediately obey that leader. I will become follower again. So there's no fight huh, for the struggle. Huh? And it could be there is a timeout. Maybe I have four notes and it's two against two. So I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I don't get majority. So then there's another uh, timeout and another election. Huh? And because the timeouts are random, the, this is actually a very rare situation, and you almost very, very quickly get a new leader. Okay. So you see, the randomness is actually very important here. Huh? Okay, I'm going to show you now another slide visualizing this, okay, in the, after this one, and you'll see better, I think, how it works. But first, let me show you the, the timeouts, okay? So the leaders crashed. We have four followers. Uh, we have the Politburo is there. Stalin has just died. And no, everyone's looking at each other, and there's no leader. And they're waiting each a random time. Okay? But it's not, it could be not any time, it's within a certain range. And this is an important parameter. Maybe they're waiting for any time between 150 and 200 milliseconds, and they pick a random number in between there. Okay? Or between 150, 155. Okay? So if they do that, uh, let's say there's four nodes. The one that is the lowest with there will probably win, okay? So if I have, for example, uh, here, 150 to 200, there's 50 milliseconds here. Uh, this is the blue one. This is the time without leader, okay? Again, it's a cumulative distribution. Huh? We run the algorithm many times, and we pick the random numbers between 150 and 200 milliseconds. And you can see that in this case, it's very fast. After 100 milliseconds, they pretty much always get a new leader. Whereas, assuming now the range is very tiny, 150, 151, that means they will all be almost the same, okay? So there will be very many stalemates. So then you get this yellow one, and then the time for a leader is much longer. It takes at uh, 1,000 millisecond, okay, a second. You see, if they, this one has a much bigger chance of a stalemate, okay, you see that? So making the interval too small is very bad. The red one has huge stalemate, huh? you see? Because it's always 150. Uh, and then the only differences is like a little bit of jitter, a little bit of differences. So they're going to be almost always doing stalemate here. Whereas if the interval is too big, like 150 to 300, then it's just going to slow down because this number is big, okay? Here the purple one is going to 300. You see the purple one is actually slower than the, this, the blue one, but, but it's wider, it's bigger. So you think there's less chance of stalemate, but 300 is bigger than 200, you see? So that means still it's going to sometimes be bigger. So there's like a sweet spot where, the, where the, you, you have to kind of tune the algorithm. Uh, but it's not a question of correctness. Huh? You tune it 
so that the, that the time without a leader is small, okay? And usually one server will time out and win the election before the others wake up, uh, unless you have some weird situation. You see how, how it works? The, why that the narrow is bad, but the too wide is also bad. And the both extremes are bad. So in the middle, there's like a good one. And it's a different reason, huh? In this one, you have a lot of stalemate. In this one, it's bad just because sometimes the minimum is going to be close to 300. It's going to be higher because the range is higher, OK? So you need to have a big range, but not too big, huh? So that's how it works, OK? Okay, there's a paper, 2014, da-da-da, already so many implementations, so great. Uh, they have a logo, okay, they have a logo, that's the most important thing, okay. Okay, let me show now the other talk, which is actually giving you scenarios. So this is really nice, and I think you get a much better intuition of it. Uh, I start with the beginning. That's a good idea. Huh? It's always a good idea. This is explaining raft. What is distributed consensus? Many nodes have to agree. Very good. Replication, leader election, distributed locks. It's very important. Okay. The history of distributed consensus protocols. I will give you now the history. That's it. Okay. Uh, the history, Paxos 1989. <laughs> I will now explain Paxos. Not really. Huh? You have a client. You request a change. You have a proposer which talks to acceptors. Uh, the acceptors send the change to the learners, and the learners will somehow make the proposer be recognized as leader. Okay, fine. No detail. Let me now explain Raft. So these are the two guys who created it. Yeah, Bo Garo and John Osterhout. Huge number of mutations, has a logo. Okay, now let me explain the algorithm. Okay, so this is actually kind of a nice talk to see. The leader, so this guy is the leader. He looks a lot like Mussolini, okay. Uh, this is a follower. I don't know if you recognize, it looks like one of the peasants in Monty Python and the Holy Grail, okay. Who doesn't like having a king or whatever. And this is a candidate, looks like a guy from Monopoly. Okay, so here's an example. I have three followers, they're sitting there. Nothing's happening, the system just started up. One of them now times out, becomes a candidate. Yes. It sends message to the ones, vote for me. And they say, okay, because they're not voting for anyone else. And he becomes a leader. So that's the usual operation, huh? The first one who becomes a candidate will become the leader. Huh? So that's pretty simple, huh? And then the leader is, is making log entries. So the log is very important, huh? the stable storage. And whenever it commits a log entry, it will. Whenever it wants to do log entry, it sends a message. It also sends heartbeats to prove it's alive, and so on. But now, catastrophe. The leader crashed. Mussolini has been hung to dry somewhere. Huh? So what happens? Well, one of the candidates, one of the followers becomes a candidate. Vote for me, yes. And now we have a new leader. Everything works. You see how wonderful it is, huh? Okay, the leader election. Now we'll see a little bit more in detail. Here on the bottom you have the time, millisecond, and the followers, the little number is the term, huh? is which election term. So we're in the first term now, okay. Time is running. Okay, the first one, uh, that one becomes a candidate for election for leader in term two. And it gets a vote. Ah, but notice this vote request, the message is lost. Oh, terrible. But this one succeeds, it goes there, and it gets a reply. Grant the vote. And it's a majority. Two out of three is a majority. So that one becomes the leader. And he sends a message to the bottom follower that it's a leader. And the bottom follower agrees. OK? A valid leader in term two. 
Let's take example of a split vote. Okay, now we have four nodes, and somehow the two of them has picked the same, the same random time up, time up. But it's random, so it happens. They request vote. They get votes. They both have two votes. Now they request vote like this, but they will not get it because they've already voted in term two. And so, and then they request vote to each other. They will not get it either. They, they each want to become the leader, okay? So no leader, okay? So they keep waiting, but there's always a timeout, again. Okay? Huh? There will be again another randomized timeout, okay? And I'm waiting, okay, waiting. Ah, the top one has now timed out, request votes. It gets the majority, and that's it. The bottom one will not get the majority, sorry. And the top one becomes the leader, okay? And it tells everyone, now I'm the leader. Uh, this candidate steps down and accepts the new leader. Uh, so clearly it's not Donald Trump, but uh, okay? So that's fine, huh? See how it works. So this is a nice presentation of the algorithm. Huh? And now let's talk a little bit about the log replication. Okay, so it's not just leaders and followers, they each have a log, which is a storage on disk, okay? Because the data is being updated uh, when the execution is running. A new uncommitted log entry. So the leader has done some computation, and Sally is added, but it's in red, because we cannot make it really committed until we know that the others have also stored it. So the leader will ask the other two to store it, they will store it, and when this one has said, yes, I have stored it, then the leader can actually commit the Sally, and then it becomes blue. Because we know it's actually stored on disk in more than in a majority of, of nodes, okay? And then, and the other one also, okay? And at the next heartbeat, the committed entries get updated everywhere, okay? Notifies followers of updated committed entries. And that's it. And now the and things now can go on, okay? So there's another heartbeat, nothing happens. Bob is now added to the leader. Sends Bob. Bob is stored. Okay, there's a bug here. There should be Bobs. There should be Bobs here. Uh, there's a few small bugs in the slides like that. Uh -huh. And then the bobs get appended, so we have blue bobs everywhere. And now let's see what happens when we have a network partition. So this is when there's not always a majority. Here we have five nodes, and there's one of them as a leader, the Sally, sends the Sally everywhere, fine, and the Sally's get committed. Okay, now we have a partition. These two nodes are stored in one room, these are in another room, and there's a break in the network. So they're isolated. So these three can talk to each other, and these two. So this is called the network partition. Happens fairly frequently. It's a different kind of failure of the communication. Okay, leader one now has a problem. Huh? Tries to do Bob. Bob gets an acknowledgement, but no majority. There's only two nodes, the leader and one follower. No majority, poor guy. He can't do anything anymore, okay? He's completely powerless. And the bottom guys see no more leader, these three, yeah? So they will time out eventually. They will not see heartbeat. They will time out. And so they, the C2 will candidate, becomes a new leader. So now we have two leaders in the system, L2 and L1 with this partition. But actually there's only one. Huh? It's the L2 is the real leader. Uh, and as soon as the partition goes away, L1 is going to uh, kneel in front of L2. Huh? So yeah, L2 is adding Tom. So there's blue Toms everywhere, except in the top. Huh? Huh? Now the partition goes away. Communication goes on again. And now, L1 can start doing things, but L2 is sending its heartbeats. Huh? 
as soon as L2, and of course L1 will no longer get a majority from anybody, huh? because all three of these are now obeying L2. Huh? So L1 will not be able to create any more blue in the logs, huh? because it will never get messages from the bottom F2. So. But L1, L2 sends a heartbeat, and then L1 steps down. Yes? So if you obey your new leader, there must be a vote between, between them. If, a new, if I'm a leader, and if a, a, a leader with a higher term number sends a heartbeat to me, I will immediately become a follower to that one. But for the followers, they will always follow the same leader? They will follow the highest leader that is sending them heartbeats. Uh, so this one will now this one will now get a heartbeat from L2 and will immediately become a follower of L2 and L1 also will become a follower of L2. Huh? Is that it's okay? Yeah. So it happens like that. You always obey the the leader with the highest term. So they all become followers. Okay. Notice the bobs are red here, huh? and as soon as the heartbeats appear here, these red ones are thrown away. Okay, the red bobs are not committed; they were never committed, so they are thrown away. And then the toms will be stored there at the next heartbeat. Huh? Instead, they were never committed because in order to commit, you have to commit through a majority. Okay, and if you commit through a majority then any majority later on will always see that. You see what I'm saying? The Tom, uh, if, if the Toms would have been in a majority, then anybody later, even if Linear Crash, would also see the Tom, okay? But here, that's not the case, huh? They were never, they were always red. They were never blue, okay? Okay, log replication. And then the final thing, log compaction. Okay, there's a problem with the logs. Uh, let's say I have variable x in the database. Its value is 10. But then I update it, 15. And I update it again, 12. So this, the, the log only stores a list of variables and the newest value. Yeah? So this can grow a lot. Question? It's about the log replication. Okay. What if there's one more node and it's on the first place? So there's three nodes on the first bit and three nodes on the next. Which one? Which? Which? Where are you now? Um, so, during the splits, here what if there's one node, one more node on the top split. Ah, so there's three and three. Yeah, three is not a majority. And but then the whole thing. Yeah, if there's three and three, well then then uh, okay. Let me go back to the case because then there's no leaders. Huh? And here. So I'm here, okay, and here, but there's three nodes on the top. So what happens? Well, the top one will only get three uh, bits, so we cannot commit anything. So the top guy cannot do anything. But what happens in the bottom? You tell me. This candidate, what happens? How many votes does he get? He can be. He can be there. He doesn't. He only gets three votes. Three is not a majority out of six. Huh? You need an actual majority. So that, in, in that case, there is no majority anywhere in the system. So basically, the system cannot do anything anymore. If there is no majority, it just stops. It's not available. That means it's, the data is still there, and it's still correct, but the system cannot progress. Okay? In order to progress, there has to be a majority. See that? Does that answer? So if there were three, three, then the whole system would, would just stop, okay? You need a majority. Is that a reason? Is that okay? And is that the question? Is that an answer to the question? Okay. So three, three, it would just stop. You see that, huh? You need an actual majority to make progress. Otherwise, the data is still consistent. And as soon as the, the, the partition goes away, then you can have a new leader and it can go on. Huh? So if you have a partition, if you're lucky, the system can still run. 
after it, like here. But if you're unlucky, it cannot. You see that? In order for it to progress, you need an actual majority. Okay? Yeah, that's a good question, huh? So that's the kind of thing you have to worry about. So this algorithm handles all cases, huh? And in the Moodle, I put a copy of the paper by Ongar and Osterhout, which is not bad, but of course it explains all the little details that I'm not explaining. Huh? Every weird case has to be handled, huh? So that paper actually goes through all the weird little cases that can happen and explains that it still works, how it still works, you see? So yeah, that's a case, 3-3. Three, three. But what if, a new note, what if one of the notes crashes here, for example? Boom. Then I have two below and two above. Well, then again, I won't have a majority below, you see? So there's lots of possibilities, huh? So it's good to think of them because it's, it works in all possibilities, huh? So you're not going to find a bug in this algorithm, huh? It's been proved and used so much that it's totally correct, huh? Okay. Pretty sure it's correct. Okay. Okay, let me now uh, just, I think we're near the end. I talk a little bit about log compaction. Okay, so this is the thing about logs. A log, whenever I update a variable, I store the variable on disk with the new value. But if I update the same variable multiple times, I will store again on disk, because actually I don't know what's on the disk. I store it and I forget it, huh? Because it's on the disk, I don't have it anymore. It's not in RAM. So if I keep updating the same variable many times, eventually the log is going to grow. And it keeps growing bigger and bigger. So eventually you have to do something called log compaction which means you only keep the latest one, of course. Huh? You don't have to keep the other ones. But for all variables, huh? there could be thousands of variables huh? in this thing. Uh, unbounded log can grow. And then there's uh, the log is, when, when the log is big, you have, to, you have to, when you recover, that means when you reboot a node, you have to read the log, okay, to update the variables. It's, lo it's logical, huh? But you don't know what's on the log uh, from outside. You read it and you update the variables. So if the same variable occurs many times, you're reading it so many, you have to go through everything, huh? Because maybe there's a million log entries, but only a thousand variables. But that last variable, that one thousandth variable, Maybe it's at the very end of the log, and you don't know where it is, okay, you see? So you have to read the whole log, huh? So sometimes you have to compact the log, and then, then they explain a little bit how you do compaction. Uh, the leader can do it, stored or independently initiated. Yeah, there's different ways of doing log compaction. And that's it, okay? Okay. So, so now we have arrived at the end of the course. I'm not going to say anything more. The course is done. If you have any questions, maybe I say a little bit about the exam. Huh? If you want to be very nasty, you could turn off the video, but maybe you could be nice and leave it on. Huh? So the exam will be partly theory and partly practical. So I'm now correcting the midterm. Huh? So you will normally get the points by the end of the week. And there was one question in the midterm where you had to write a FIFO. And I really wanted you to, for example, when you send a FIFO between two nodes, uh, you have to keep track of the, the message numbers. That means the sender has to have a number for every destination node. So it actually needs an array of numbers. You see that, sender? Because for each destination link, source destination, you have different messages, different numbers. Some of people wrote code where they only have one variable for the sender. I'm sorry, I had to subtract the point for that. Okay? And the receiver can receive the messages out of order. So for every source node, you receive messages together with their number. So you need, you need an array indexed by source node, which keeps basically a list uh, or set, whatever, of the message number pairs, okay? And you also need a number for each source node 
which gives you the last one that you've actually delivered. So the next thing to do is to find out whether the last one plus one is there. And if it is, you can deliver it, because you have to deliver in order, you see? So you need to have a couple of arrays of the source and the destination. Many people actually did it right, so I, that's very nice, but not everybody. Some people did only one variable, and that was not good. In this pseudocode, you can have, you can have arrays very easily indexed by messages or by nodes or by anything. You can assume very sophisticated data structures. Huh? So don't worry about that. Just assume if you need it. Huh? So this kind of stuff I can ask. But it will always be a, a change compared to something we saw in the course. So I will never ask you to totally invent something new. But I might ask you to uh, do a variation. And you might need to have one or two extra data structures, okay? So that means you have to actually understand how the algorithms work, huh? In order to make the variation. And also, I will ask theory questions. So the properties, the formal properties, very often I will say, give me the formal properties of this, and then show me a pseudocode implementation. So you have to give the formal properties so that also I'm going to uh, assume. And then for all of the stuff in the second part, uh, I can, for example, for, for uh, Skype and for um, um, the super peer architecture, uh, the one with the, oh, oh shit, I'm, I'm losing my, there's a word that starts with G, the gradient, that's it, the gradient architecture. So you have to be able to explain it at least uh, intuitively. We did not give, see the code for that. How do you create a gradient architecture? You have to run in gossip where the nodes will somehow migrate to other nodes that have the same power as them, which means the powerful nodes all will go to the center. So that kind of stuff you have to be able to explain it. Huh? So you need at least uh, a kind of precise intuition on these things. Huh? Okay? And I can ask you also to explain cumulative distribution functions, maybe I give you one, ask you to explain it, make some deduction based on it, okay? Uh, so that kind of stuff I can explain, or I can ask you how to use gossip to determine network size, uh, using all the little tricks that we saw in the course. So that kind of stuff you need, I'm not going to ask code for that, but you need to have a good, precise understanding still, huh? enough to explain precise things. So it has to be precise. Being vague does not, is not done. So if, for example, if I ask you what is a partially synchronous system, then you have to start, say, by uh, in the beginning there's no time bound, so it's asynchronous, and eventually, so after some finite time, but which you don't know, some bounds exist which you don't know. So all of that is important. Huh? The existence of the bounds, the fact that the bounds are unknown, okay, even when you know they, even when they exist, their values are unknown. See, the, the, all those little details are important, okay? See that? So that's all important. Otherwise, it's not partially synchronous. That's part of the business, huh? That's what it is. You don't actually know the bounds, even when they exist. You're never actually even sure that they exist or not. You just know they will eventually exist, okay? So all of that is important, huh? Okay, I don't know if you have any final questions on that. So the, you will have the points of the midterm by Friday evening. Uh, so I'm already more than halfway through. It's a pain reading all your code, but some of the code is nice that you've written. Uh, so, but I'm reading all of it, huh? So, yeah. And, uh, and so the midterm will come for five points on the final exam. So remember that if you did well on the midterm, that's important to know before the blockers because uh, it determines how you organize your time. Huh? If you got uh, four out of five on the midterm, then probably you can, unless you really want to get 20 out of 20, it's not worth studying that part. You know it already. Huh? Okay, and then of course the project counts for five points too, so that the whole exam will be on either 10 or 15 points. Huh? Okay, everybody, that's it. 
So now have a Merry Christmas, everybody. So I'm not putting the correct down. I will wish you a Merry Christmas. Even for the non-Christians, you could also have a Merry Christmas, okay? Uh -huh. That's it.